talk with you about surveillance on social media. Who does it? Now, something that has been uh, <clears throat> overtaken us, really, something that was just a few years ago a novelty, is now something that we take for granted. It's all around us. We can't evade it, even if we want to. Most people embrace it. Now, I've been thinking about uh, questions of surveillance for more than 20 years now. And so what interests me is the questions about what is happening to that personal information that flows through and sometimes floods the internet using social media. So I want to ask the question then, uh, is it them watching us? Now, for some people it seems to me that although there is an inestimable, inestimable amount of personal data floating around in the internet, few people seem to realize just how accessible it is, what is out there to be harvested. Maar kent je rekeningnummer van buiten? Ik denk dat ik het wel weet. Die staat wel negatief op je bankrekening. Ja? 9, 7. Last month, mm -hmm. you spent 200 euro's on alcohol. Vorige maand, 300 euro aan kleding gespendeerd. 8, ja. 5. Voor een huis dat van eigenaar gaat veranderen. 795.000 euro. Ja, maar eigenlijk. 41. Ja. Is dat juist? Ja, dat is juist. Oh my god. Oh man. Ah, dat is kwinio eng. a warning ad from a Belgian bank. That just tells you about some of the financial stuff. Now, what are we thinking about here? When we talk about social media, we're talking about the world in which it is said we are dealing with user-generated content. So that sounds like we are all doing it. Well, what do you think Mark Zuckerberg is doing it for? What the media platforms, the companies are doing is they are trading in personal information. That is where they get their profit. That's what they are there for. And so we have to put that user-generated content next to what they are actually doing. And what they're trying to do, of course, well, they're doing surveillance. They are using those personal data in order to try to influence us as consumers, in order to try to shape our self-identity in order to help us to engage in the world in particular ways. So that's what they are all about. And so it's not surprising that schools and employers, police departments, security companies, other government departments, they are all also very interested in the world of social media personal data. Take employers, for example. It is sobering to realize that an increasing number of employers use social media 
in addition to the conventional resume. Perhaps I should say it should be sobering. Do you realize that 76% of the photos on Facebook in Britain show users in an inebriated state? So you may wonder what is going on when you think about how other people are using those data that we put up there. Some, employees, uh, some employers, for example, are now asking applicants if they can have their Facebook passwords so that they can see for themselves so much for your privacy settings. Social media is driven by what you, what you might call a market logic, and the market logic is there trying to create categories, trying to make profiles of us, trying to find out what they can so that they can put together a composite picture of who we are. But of course, Facebook was a gift for that and other social media too, because instead of them having to dream up the categories, we contribute to those categories and to the categorization. So every time that we post some image, every time that we uh, make a post online, we are contributing something about our tastes, our preferences, what our uh, musical tastes are, what our sporting tastes are. They are interested, of course, in the uh, things that we eat, so food preferences, in political affiliations, in religious commitments, you name it. The process of making those categories is something to which we contribute. We are helping them. And of course, it's the categories that give the clues. We, don't, we can have our privacy settings really high, but anybody who is trolling through those data and trying to find out about us can make a composite picture of us from the preferences and uh, tastes and habits of our friends. So on Facebook, you see your friends betray you. However, those categories don't necessarily fit how we might want to see ourselves. So our visibility to the world, to those organizations, to those corporations, and so on, our visibility may not be the way that we would want necessarily to present ourselves. The technologic behind it may be somewhat misleading. But that's only the beginning. I was asking the question then, well, is it them surveilling us? And I want to go beyond that and suggest that there's something more going on. I want to suggest that today, we are also doing the surveillance. Social media, of course, is all about sharing, about connecting with others, about keeping in touch with our friends, and maybe also finding out a little bit about our friends. Indeed, the uh, vision critical polling company in Canada, along with the Surveillance Studies Center at Queen's University, did a little survey of uh, 1,000 Canadians, 1,000 Americans, 1,000 Brits in the uh, summer of 2012, and found this, that more than a third of respondents in all three countries admitted to doing what they called tracking and monitoring others online. Well, we thought uh, that could just be a, a leading question. 30% seems rather high. And so we asked other questions as well. We asked, for example, how the people who did this thought that those whom they were watching without their knowledge would feel about it. More than half in each case said that the persons would be embarrassed or unhappy if they knew that they were being tracked and monitored in that way. So there's something different going on here. We don't want to just talk about the corporations and police departments that want to know about us. And from my vantage point, I would say that we are seeing here an element in an emerging surveillance culture, an emerging culture of surveillance. And by this, I mean something that goes beyond the Orwellian surveillance state something that goes beyond the so-called surveillance society, where consumer surveillance becomes dominant, and actually uh, government departments, police departments, security agencies get their clues from what uh, corporations are doing in the consumer sphere. It goes beyond that. What I want to suggest is that this consumer culture is one that is not just out there, 
not just that we participate in every time we uh, put up our posts, our images, our uh, information. It's also something that is inside us. For better or worse, we do surveillance as well. Now, of course, social media is all sorts of positive things. It is participatory. It is engaging to the point of addiction for some. It is participatory. It is uh, something that, is, that may be empowering. It is something that for many of us is fun. So that on the one hand. I'm not saying either that it is somehow merely negative. Surveillance is always ambiguous and in this case too we see and hear about many stories where people have been struck down by some illness or accident and they have found a wonderful community of support online. You can read dozens of stories like that on the internet and within social media. So it may be a place for real social support and encouragement for others. So I'm not denying that for a moment. I'm not suggesting either that because of what I'm saying about surveillance, somehow we should pull out of using social media or the internet. Actually, it's not really possible in the world today. It's too late. But it's also too late in the sense that our online and offline lives, as we used to think about them, have bled into each other so much that we really have to think of there being a digital dimension to our human lives now. And therefore, we have to go beyond that online, offline distinction that we used to make. And of course, we see that because lives are touched in profound ways. If you think about those uh, dramatic and tragic cases of cyberbullying, for example, or if you think of the pain of a broken relationship that was discovered through a status update. Lives are really touched. The online, offline distinction doesn't really mean a lot today. So I think we have to ask some new questions, some quite diff different questions. Not just the questions that we might ask about surveillance in general. Who's watching? What do they know? How do they find out? How much information do they have? What are they doing with it? What are the consequences of that information? All good questions to ask, but we've gone beyond that kind of Kafka-esque question. That's still there, it's still important, but we've gone beyond it. Those people who uh, say that they track and monitor others online, well, that's what they do, and they say, on the one hand, the same people will say they oppose monitoring of their lives and profiling by corporations. But they're the people who are also doing that tracking and monitoring online. This is why I think we need to ask some new questions. That which emerges, that surveillance which emerges in a context that we think of as fun, enjoyable, participatory, may not be fun, may not be harmless for all those who are involved. But not only that. If we're doing con surveillance in a context where fun is the dominant motif, then that could serve to naturalize, to domesticate, to uh, make it seem normal to engage in surveillance. When, as I say, it's ambiguous. There are many contexts within which surveillance may be far from harmless. So here's the challenge before us then. We have to think in new ways. Imagine in fresh ways our personal information. Think about it differently, not just my privacy, and how can I get those privacy settings higher? How can I really give them teeth, make them work? It's beyond my privacy. We need to learn to manage our visibility and the visibility of others within this world in which the online, offline have bled into each other. And I think there are two ways in particular that we could think about this. One has to do with what I was saying first of all about the categorization by corporations, police, and so on using social media. And that is that we need to seek new kinds of information policies, ones that go far beyond a mere concern with privacy, important though that may be. We need to think of information policies that relate to the kind of social sorting that I was talking about that is done through those categories.
We need to find new ways of pressing for accountability within those organizations that process personal data from day to day. And we need to do it much more sensitively and carefully, but also much more urgently. Otherwise, we will lose not only our privacy, but freedom itself and fairness. We lose freedom in so many ways. For example, uh, if you have photographs taken of you while you're at a legal uh, political protest, then what happens to those photos? Some people don't even engage in legal political protest anymore because they fear what might happen to the photos that are harvested. Governments in many countries around the world have also, in recent years, been trying to tap into the kinds of information that in, uh, internet service providers maintain. And they have been trying to get police access to those kinds of information without a court warrant. It's have happened and is happening here in Canada. Our freedoms are at stake. We need some new kinds of policies, new kinds of ways of approaching these issues. In terms of fairness, what about those who are rewarded? What about those who get the, get the discounts? What about those who get benefits from the customer relationships that they develop through social media? Have we ever thought about the fact that there are other people who do not get discounts, who do not get rewards? They are systematically excluded from, well, in fact, from being customers. The companies have a name for it. It's called demarketing. Fairness is right there in the picture, too. So I think we need to create new codes for care with personal information. We need to think of new ways of considering what it is that we're doing when we go online. And we need to go beyond the negative and the protective. We need to go beyond my privacy. We need to go beyond the harms that may be done. Those are all important, but we need also to go beyond them. We need to imagine beyond the narrow uh, limits of the technical and the commercial. We need to think about not just that, but the good of the other. The good of the other, it seems to me, should be paramount. Sure, we can uh, look after our own visibility, manage our own visibility, but surely we could also think about the visibility of others. Other people are piqued by our posts. Other people are touched by our tweets. I have uh, a neighbor, and uh, Deb says this to her teenage daughter. She says, if you can't say it to her face, then don't say it online. You know, in the, both in the corporate world that I'm talking about and in all our individual lives, there may be points at which the appropriate response to surveillance is, don't do it. But for most of us, most of the time, there are other ways of thinking about this. And I want to suggest that we can be pioneers in this. The call to be our sister's or our brother's keeper now has to go digital. We have to think with, uh, in the way that my friend uh, Eric Stoddart says. He says that we should ask whether it's surveillance of others or surveillance for others. And I want to leave you with that question. When we think about surveillance on social media, then are we thinking about surveillance that is going to foster human flourishing. Thank you very much.